Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 443 of the podcast and it's Friday the 2nd of August 2019 as I record this. Can you believe it's August? (laughs) It's just crazy. I know I say this every month but I always feel like time is flying by. I don't know if that's a middle age thing. So in this episode, I'm talking to Pamela Wilson about content marketing strategy. And you should all know by now how much I love content marketing because my business is built on it. My income is powered by the podcast and you guys, the blog, my email list, which is also driven by content as well. So yes, last week's show was about Amazon advertising. And uh, yes, they work as do Facebook ads, BookBub ads, all the other paid ads you can do. But they are spike traffic. So you stop paying, you stop selling. And most of us have, I've noticed, (laughs) I'm not the only one who has resistance towards doing paid ads because the activity itself is not fulfilling. Whereas content marketing, I find I love to do content marketing. I learn from this show, which is why I keep doing it. I love finding out things to share with you. I love... um, you know, I I just love creating things in the world. So to me, content marketing is inherently interesting and rewarding and exciting. So this week, for example, I did a batch of interviews for my books and travel podcast. And um, I talked about Djibouti in the Horn of Africa with one author and then about walking the Camino de Santiago with another, then Beijing and on to Greenland. So I'm loving what I can do with content marketing around books and travel, but also enjoying the process of doing it anyway. So uh, of course, I will monetize that new site and new show at some point. But now I'm just enjoying creating content as such. And as Pamela talks about, it can be part of your body of work. This podcast is part of my body of work as Joanna Penn. And that's just very cool. So I want you to see content marketing as not a short term spike in your book sales, but about long term and building an asset that will drive your income for the long term. And I I just know way too many people who focus on immediate income now. And of course, we all need immediate income now. But even if you could do 80-20, so 80% of your time is spent on cash flow now and 20% is building things for the future, then I think that would still pay off. And then over time, you can switch that percentage around as, as I have done. So anyway, more on content marketing in the interview with Pamela coming up. And Pamela was on the show uh, back in episode 301. So you can go back and listen to that as well if you want more on content marketing. So not much going on in publishing or book marketing. It is the summer (laughs) and uh, publishing tends to shut down in August. And so, yeah, I did a long introduction on publishing last week. So this week I'm just going to do a personal update. So Map of Plagues came out yesterday and it's funny because I actually forgot it was coming out. (laughs) I think this is what happens when you've written quite a lot of books, but I had scheduled it all. Um, It was just, you know, it was on pre-order. So a month ago, I scheduled it all. I did add the updated book file about a week ago to fix the typos, but all the print books are there, the paperback, large print, hardback. um, And Basically, it went out and I'm really, I I love this book. I'm very happy with it. But something unexpected happened with this book. My Arcane series uh, is an episodic series. So each book can be read. You can start anywhere and you'll still understand everything. And each book is is a standalone as well as being part of a series. But what has happened with this, and I intended for the Map Walker series to be the same. But what happened with this book, and of course, I'm a discovery writer. I wish 
I could plot more, but I don't. So um, I, I just, this is me. <laughs> so I'm a discovery writer. And what I found in the final chapters was shock horror. This is a trilogy. This is not an episodic series. So what has been interesting with this book, Map of Plagues, is that I'm not going to do a lot of promotion with it. So I'm not going to do paid ads. I'm not going to do anything on book one as yet. What I am, what I need to do is write book three. And once I have a finished, completed trilogy, then I can do decent amounts of book marketing on it. And by then, of course, I'll also have audiobooks. I will probably do a box set. So this is an interesting phenomenon around trilogies or uh, series that have an arc in themselves. So I know authors who will write, <laughs> well, of course, Game of Thrones, I think, what is that, six book arc or something? But many authors will have a long arc over a, over a long series, but this is definitely a trilogy. So yeah, it, it and that changed in the last few chapters. And so that's why I'm not going nuts on marketing Map of Plagues. I'm going to write Map of the Impossible, which is the third book. And once that's out, then I'll do a lot more marketing. So yeah, if you like Lainey Taylor, uh, these are kind of, they're not modelled on Lainey Taylor, but I, I love her her books, um, Daughter of Smoke and Bone and also um, Strange the Dreamer. I really enjoyed the last one of that. So this has that kind of edge to it, if you know Lainey. So yeah, so that happened. And it's funny, I definitely feel an anticlimax when a book comes out. I I talked about this in the uh, Successful Author Mindset. It's one of those things that is not talked about enough in the industry. So I'm mentioning it now. The feeling of, okay, so that's done then. And I guess I just start another one. <laughs> And it's funny because I'm really proud of it on the one hand. And on the other hand, I know I need to write that third book. And so I feel like there's just more work ahead and I need to not feel like it's work. I need to want to finish the story. And uh, I already love the idea of Map of the Impossible and I've got some ideas Um but yeah, so I wanted to just mention that. I love the book, but um, like I said, it's going to be a while until I market it a lot. You can still enjoy book one and book two if you want to start, say Map of Shadows, then um, Map of Plagues. I've also been editing public speaking for authors, creatives and other introverts uh, because, <laughs> okay, you're going to laugh, the AI stuff that I'm working on, so I'm looking at AI um, voice synth, which I've talked about before. And in order to train an AI voice, I need a lot of voice data. So I need to get more of my backlist into audio with my voice so that I can train um, an AI voice, which is kind of hilarious. You need to do more in order to train more. Uh, so public, I thought, well, public speaking is not available as an audio book. So I'll just pick that up. That's evergreen. Uh, that will be good. Uh, and then I started editing it. And my goal was always just to upload a new file. But actually, this is going to be a true second edition. I've updated quite a lot. And I wrote it in 2014, when I was doing a lot of speaking. And things have changed in the technology space, um, and also my own processes. So I, that will now be a second edition. It will be released as a new book. Uh, it will have an audio book and print book as well. And so my goal is to do a simultaneous release. Now, this is really hard to do because you have no control over when your audio book appears for sale. Once you submit it to ACX and find a way, it might be three weeks, it might be longer. You can't have, you can't actually set a specific day. It depends on their backlog of technical checks and things like that. So what I'll probably do is I'll have to wait for the notification of the audiobook and then upload the print and the ebook files and like put it out like that. So almost wait for the audio, then publish, which feels very unnatural to me. But um, I definitely want to try a simultaneous release. So we, we shall see. But you know, it's all about experimentation, my friends. 
<laughs> it also made me think about the maintenance of intellectual property. So uh, going back to the metaphor of actual physical property, like a house, everybody needs to revamp a place. So if you had moved into a house in 2014 and it's five years later, chances are you might need to revamp it a bit, maybe do some painting, maybe add in something, redo the shower, whatever. <laughs> For our books, it's the same thing. So every five years, um, some people do it more regularly, but years just fly by, right? So have a look back. If you're someone who's been doing this a while, maybe you need a new cover. Maybe you need a new blurb. If you write nonfiction, maybe you need an updated edition. Maybe you need to update the back matter. For example, if you write fast and you look at your backlist for the last five years, Five years, the book you put out five years ago, if you haven't updated the back matter, is going to miss all those books you've put out since then. So, what can you do? Like, you might even withdraw the book altogether. You might just decide it's not relevant anymore. So, a book can earn you money for the rest of your life and 50 to 70 years after you die, according to copyright, but only if you make sure you use the rights or license them and get your rights back if you, if you've, if they're out there and also if you keep it maintained. So my challenge to you today is if your book or books were a property, a physical property, and somebody walked in now, if you walked into this place, would it need a spring clean or a revamp or a complete overhaul to make the best of it and and make people want to give it a try? So that's my challenge to you today. Um, I will be getting into narrating the audiobooks for Map of Shadows and Map of Plagues. Um, But, you know, again, I'll be doing a much bigger push on those books once the trilogy is complete. So hence getting into public speaking now. Uh, I'm also still progressing with the German nonfiction with the aim of having three books out in German before Frankfurt Book Fair, which I am intending to go to. So busy, busy. And of course, I am off to podcast movement um, next week. So I'm preparing that. The itinerary looks amazing. If you are going to podcast movement in 2019, make sure you tweet me at The Creative Pen or if you are there and see me, come and say hi. So thanks for all your emails and tweets. And there were quite a few comments on the show last week with Russell and Michael. Uh, So um, Gladys Strickland says, I listen to podcasts while cleaning the house and washing dishes. Best motivation to get them done. And Writing Things says, my relationship with mowing my lush, vigorous Queensland grass was totally transformed by Joanna Penn. (laughs) With my trusty earbuds, I listened to hours of her wonderful author interviews while taming that lawn and has a picture of a lawnmower. Now, I used to live in Queensland, Australia. I know how big that place is. <laughs> it is huge. So um, writing things, that looks like a uh, continuing job. Good job I have a backlist. Uh, Carla Fred says, ice, ice, baby, <laughs> which made me laugh. So last week's into in the... In- Um, in the intro, I mentioned something that did sound like it came from the song Ice Ice Baby. Um, So yeah, and now that's back in your head. It's an earworm. (laughs) Um, Just a couple more. Monique says, I'm a new listener to your podcast and waiting for successful self-publishing to be delivered. My word for the year is realisation. This year, I've come to a big realisation about my publishing journey. Thanks for your help as I take my first steps realization is fantastic. I think we all have those moments where we realize things. Uh, I remember when the penny dropped around intellectual property assets, and in fact, assets in general as a financial idea. (laughs) I was like, oh, you build an asset and it makes you money for the long term. Awesome. (laughs) So yes, realizations happen over time. Uh, And then, yeah, finally, Blair McLean says, also thanks for making successful self-publishing free. And yes, you can get successful self-publishing, which is the ebook for free on all platforms. And now it's available in audio as well. So if you get the ebook for free uh, on Amazon, you can get a really cheap audio version. Um, Blair says, now I have a comprehensive publishing plan for my first superhero novel. Love the podcast too. Fantastic.
Okay, so today's show is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life, and I'll play a word from the KWL team in a minute. This corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription, and editing, but my time in creating the show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. And as ever, this means so much to me. And amusingly, when I started on Patreon years ago, I didn't know what I was doing, I didn't expect really anyone to support me. I didn't expect the relationship that I now have with those of you who support the show on Patreon. And uh, it just makes me so happy to go on there every week. So thanks to new patrons, Ruben, Melanie Parkinson, Martha Knox, Rebecca Pike, Linda Nelson, Penny and Eugene Pitch. And of course, thanks to everyone who's been supporting the show for years. You guys are superstars. I'm actually going to a Patreon event at Podcast Movement. So I hope to learn more about what I can do to serve uh, my audience there um, some more. Uh, If you want to support the show on Patreon, you get several years worth of backlist audio on uh, Q&A, where I, I answer questions every month from the Patreon audience on writing, publishing, book marketing, making a living with your writing. And often you'll get behind the scenes or early access to stuff uh, that I'm doing. So hopefully you'll, you'll find that interesting. You can support the show with just a couple of dollars a month at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. And yes, I know I changed from Patreon to Patreon. (laughs) It's that American thing, American British thing. (laughs) Does it really matter? I don't think so. I will be doing the Q&A this week as well. So that is coming out soon. Right, here's a word from Kobo Writing Life, and then we'll be into the interview. Hi, I'm Chrissy. And I'm Stephanie. And we're from Kobo Writing Life, Kobo's free, fast and easy self-publishing platform. KWL was built by authors for authors, and our team of dedicated book lovers is always working hard to help authors reach new readers around the world. Our author-first approach is why we build our promotions tool, an easy and affordable way for you to market your book directly to Kobo readers right in the KWL dashboard. We post Kobo sales happening soon, many of which are exclusive to KWL authors, and you submit your books. We offer lots of promos that don't require you to drop your price because we know it's a pain to coordinate pricing across retailers. So if that sounds good to you, keep an eye out for percent off promotions and buy more, save more sales, where you can submit your titles and leave the rest to us. And if you're using free as a marketing strategy, you can submit to be featured on Kobo's free page, which gets a ton of traffic. If you're a KWL author and don't yet have access to the promotions tool, email us at writinglife at kobo.com and we'll get you sorted. We're all about providing excellent support. If you want to learn more about KWL, check out our blog, podcast, and find us on social. You can create your free account at kobo.com slash writinglife. Back to you, Joanna. Pamela Wilson is an author, professional speaker and consultant at Big Brand System, where she helps businesses with content marketing and branding. Her latest book is Master Content Strategy, how to maximize your reach and boost your bottom line every time you hit publish. Welcome back to the show, Pamela. I'm so happy to be here. Hello. (laughs) It's great to have you back. So let's start. Um, Can you start by defining content marketing? One of the most beautiful things that content marketing does is it it is marketing. That's why that word marketing is in there. But it's marketing in a way where you are actually delivering value to someone in, in front of everything else. So before everything else, you're delivering value. And what this ends up doing when you share your expertise in this way and where you when you share valuable information is it ends up building trust in people and it makes them more open and more receptive to doing business with you. So I think that's one of the most amazing things that really strong content marketing can do. So just to be clear, it is free content that is meant to drive sales in some way. It is. It absolutely is. It's free. It's freely available for the most part. It's just out there for the taking. Um, And it's a little more difficult than in the past to stand out, but we can talk about that. Yeah. So uh, just what what are some specific examples, I guess, of content marketing? Like what what, what are some of the, the ways we can do that? 
Right. So the way that I define it is a little bit like a medium agnostic in a way. So um, I believe that content marketing can be delivered in words. So this would be something like a blog post, but it can also be delivered by audio, which is what we're doing right now, and also by video. So the, the format used is not as important as the value of the information that's delivered. Mm, fantastic. And yes, of course, <laughs> I've been podcasting for 10 years, so I, um, I'm a strong believer in content marketing. But one of the questions that comes up a lot is, does content marketing still work? Uh, especially in the author community right now, people are pouring all their energy into paid ads on Amazon ads, for example. So yeah, does content marketing still work? <laughs> Well, I do think that paid ads are a great way to drive awareness, a great way to drive attention, but I think there is such an important role for content. And I have heard a lot of evidence of people who have run ads to pieces of content that end up doing better than just ads directly to a, a product. And it's for that same reason that when you run an ad to a piece of content, you're delivering some value. In the case of authors, they may be delivering a taste of their book and people get a chance to read a bit of it and then they're ready to go ahead and invest and buy. So I think that there is a really strong argument to be made for creating content Really great content, though. And that's the difference between maybe five or 10 years ago. Um, the Internet was kind of this blank space and we could fill it up with content and the quality of the content wasn't quite as important because there's so much more content now. We do really have to focus on quality. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the book I wrote to help people to create more consistent and high quality content over time. Yeah, I think that's so true. The other thing on ads versus uh, content marketing, for me, it feels like ads are, say you run an Amazon ad, which really can't go to content, it goes direct to a book. Um, that is one click, it might be one sale. Um, whereas content is a longer term thing. So a paid ad is, is immediate, content is long term. W would you say that would also be a difference? Yes, I love that. And I have an analogy, actually. I, you know me well enough to know that I love my analogy. So my analogy is that an ad is kind of like a dating app. So it's like you're, you know, you're swiping right on a book that you want. And you go directly to that book. And like you said, you might buy that book. Content marketing is actually like dating. You're investing time to get to know the author. You're getting to understand the world that their books exist in. And it's more of an investment. And like you said, there's a better chance that it will be a long term relationship because there's an investment. Yeah. And that's why um, I just mentioned to you before the call and I've talked about it on my show. I've started another podcast, Books and Travel, around my fiction because I found over 10 years of this podcast that it does build that trust, as you say. And sometimes people just aren't ready to buy on that first view or that first hearing about you. Yes, absolutely. Um, people are, you know, they're particular about how they're going to spend their time these days. There's a lot of content to consume out there, a lot of books to read, a lot of, you know, in the internet, lots of podcasts to listen to and videos to watch. And people are particular. And if you can create some kind of trust-based relationship with them, they're more likely to invest in you. And honestly, you're doing people a favor because, I know that my life gets less crazy when I just decide to focus on a small number of topics or people at the same time, and I kind of ignore the rest. It's so much easier. Yeah, I think you're right. You kind of choose your uh, influencers, your own influencers, and then tune out everyone else, which which is really cool. So one of the things um, I love from the book, a quote, you say, think about your content as a body of work. And this is probably unusual for a lot of people, but I completely agree because, again, this podcast, 10 years, over 430 episodes, this is part of my body of creative work, but it is content marketing. So how, how can authors reframe content creation as, as creative, I guess? 
Uh, what I love to think about when I think about authors, because at this point now I have done both, right? I've done online content marketing and I've written books. And what I find with books is that it it is a wonderful way to express your ideas and express your creativity in this format that's very tangible and it's it's pretty permanent, right? I mean, I know books can be updated, but it's a fairly permanent final product. When you look at content, there's this impermanence to it that it can be very refreshing, I think. Um, you publish a podcast and then next week you publish another and the next week you publish another and the new ones almost replace the older ones. It's like a moving stream and the older pieces of content kind of move down the stream. And I think that's wonderful because honestly, it takes some of the pressure off. We may feel a lot of pressure that every, you know, every word and every chapter in our books needs to be perfectly polished. And a piece of content doesn't have that same kind of pressure. Obviously, you want to try to hit the highest standards, but you get another chance next week to get it right. So if this week's piece of content wasn't this epic world shaking, you know, piece of information, you have another chance to get it right next week. No single piece of content needs to do all the work of communicating your view of the world. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it definitely begs the question then, um, because for example, I feel this sometimes, which is I have a certain amount of words in me per day or per week, and I should use those words for my books. And the more books I write, um, potentially the more money I can make. So how do you, how do you, and you've obviously written books as well. How do you decide what is something that is a piece of content marketing versus something that goes into a book? Mm, that is such a good question. Um, so I think a traditional marketer would say your content marketing should talk about why and what, and your book should talk about how, right? This is a, a concept that goes way back in marketing and, and in digital information in general. You know, people say kind of tease why it's important and what people should be doing in your piece of content. And then in the paid content, like a book or a course, um, you show them how step by step. And I, I believe that to a certain extent, I think that's probably helpful, but I also think that there are ways that you can create content that's very, very useful that allows people to put something into practice immediately. So I think if you see a concept that you can explain in let's say 1500 words, and it's, it's kind of, um, it has a beginning and an end and in and of itself, it's useful. That can be a wonderful piece of content. And then of course you can give people an expanded version of it and you can send them to your book to get that. But I, I do believe content marketing needs to be more than just a glossing over of the basic concepts. It needs to be useful. Yeah. And actually, I would almost go the other way now, especially in this fast moving world. If you are mentioning anything at all that will go out of date, <laughs> then um, don't put that in a book because, as you say, it's it's definitely a pain to update. So, you know, you and I both know people who have, say, a book on Facebook advertising, whereas as soon as that comes out, it's going to be out of date. So and it's the sort of how to stuff should now technically at least should be on a website <laughs> and the, the higher up stuff, the strategy is you've got a content strategy can go in a book because it's more evergreen. Right. I think it depends a lot on the topic. Um, I write a lot about evergreen topics on my blog and I, ha I do have some how-to information there. Um, but I think if you're writing about something that's not, for example, a social media platform that changes all the time <laughs> and whose changes are out of your control, really. I mean, it's just that it's their business and they're going to do what they want. So I think if you're writing about that, then yes, you need to put it in a place that you can easily update um, and put a date on it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. this this was this was accurate as of this writing on this date. Um but I, I talk a lot about topics, you know, business topics that are somewhat evergreen. So I feel comfortable putting those into books as well. 
Mm, yeah, and I've found over time I want to focus more and more on on evergreen topics. But um, one of the things you mentioned uh, a bit earlier was standing out because it is a crowded market. And I mean, authors have this problem and we all have this problem on, on say, the Kindle store now because there's so many millions of books, but it's kind of even uh, worse online where there are so many, um, you know, blogs and even now so many podcasts. So how do you create content that is remarkable enough, I guess, to to be good enough to stand out? Right. Well, I think having some kind of underlying structure can be really helpful. And that was what I covered in my first book, which you and I have already talked about, Master Content Marketing. That book is really more about constructing your piece of content and giving it a structure so that it's always going to be useful. Um, The first parts of the content, the headline and the first line are, are basically just to keep people on the page and reading. But then there's this underlying structure where you're moving people from an introduction into a set of subheads and the main copy. You're adding some kind of summary at the end and then some kind of call to action because this is a piece of content marketing and you want them to take some sort of action, even if it's just leaving a comment. So it's it's having that underlying structure that I think can really help to remind you of the basic elements that need to be in every piece of content you create. And then after that, it's things that most of us already know. Do your research, support your claims with research. Um, Make sure that everything is written in a way that's grammatically correct. Use um, the second person. So write to you. Make it seem very personal as much as possible. Um, Avoid, you know, standing at an altar and making pronouncements, but rather make it seem very, very personal. And then I recommend things like adding images to break up. If If you have a long piece of content, adding images every so often to break up that content making sure you go back and add things like bulleted lists, block quotes, create some subheads within your content so that people can kind of skim down the page. All of those things add value and just make for a more pleasant reading experience, which is part of it as well. If you want people to be on your page consuming your content, you have to make it easy to read and pleasant. Mm, yeah, I definitely think you're right. And, and those things you're talking about are, and this is an, an important distinction between writing a book and writing copy. As you say, the copy might have the word you a lot, which we don't often necessarily do in our um, books. And also that layout with images uh, designed almost for, for scanning and, and and looking better. So um, those are some really great tips. And, and as you said, we did another interview on more detail. So let's get um, back into the strategy. So you've split the book into life cycles, which I think is brilliant for people at different levels of the the journey. So if someone is just starting out, uh, what should they focus on? I did this out of complete necessity because I just, I had coached so many people who were looking at these websites that had eight, nine, and 10 years worth of content. And they were just starting out and they were looking at this content management system that was a complete blank, right? Mm. And it's so daunting. And and so what I wanted to address was this concept that at every stage of the journey, your goals are going to change. And you need to just focus on the goals for the stage you're in and then move on to the next. So don't don't compare your brand new site to somebody else's site that's been online for a very long time because they started out exactly where you are. So in that first year, I call it your, I call it the birth through year one. So this is the first year of a brand new website. And what I recommend that people do is to get into the habit and the rhythm of writing a new piece of content every week. And the reason for that is twofold. So the main reason is that at the end of the year, If you take a couple of weeks of vacation, you'll have about 50 pieces of content. So this is a fantastic way to tell the search engines what your site is about. Because if you've written 50 pieces of content on related topics, the search engines will know what it is that your website is about. And in your case, in the case of authors, they'll know what your books are are covering because you've got content that kind of supports your book's topics. 
Then I recommend that people do this also just to kind of build their skills as content creators. Because after you've gotten to this rhythm of creating a new piece of content every week, you're going to have a very high skill level by the time you go into the second year of your website. So it's as much for for the ability to populate your website as it is for your ability to grow as a content creator. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And it's funny because I'm kind of in two places. So books and travel is, um, I only started that as we are recording this. I started it a couple of months ago, uh, three months ago. So and it's a new domain. It's it's unknown. It, all the things you're talking about are true, even though I've got 10 years experience. So I kind of know what I'm doing, but it's still, I still have to build up this, this new site from scratch. The other thing I'd add is that I don't, uh, I have some plans for monetization, but I am not expecting to turn any of them on until at least a year in. So w- a lot of people seem to expect that they'll make money from a website straight away. If they figure out how to do that, I hope that they'll share it with me (laughs) because (laughs) I haven't figured out how to do it. I think there's, you know, and that's why it's so wonderful if you have a way to do it as almost a side gig during this first year. So you're not depending on your website to just, you know, print cash for you. (laughs) You have something else that is bringing in income and then you're just developing and investing in the site for the first year and investing in, in yourself as a content creator if you don't know how to write content and you haven't created it in the past. Yeah, absolutely. So then the next level is, and I know many authors listening will have this, at some point they were told you should have a blog. And, you know, maybe a couple of years ago, they did some blog posts and it didn't go so well, or they just didn't find it. They didn't get into it. They didn't learn about copywriting. Maybe they just put some personal stuff with no real headline on. Um, I've seen that over and over again, you know, my day uh, as the headline, for example. And um, so if an author has a site that might be a couple of years old with maybe 10 posts on, um, you know, so they know a bit about how WordPress might work, for example, but they just have something that needs work and help. (laughs) What do they do to get going again? Do they blow it all away and start again or do they revamp? I think that it's never too late to revamp. Um, They can build on the skills that they, you know, the things that they figured out when they tried the first time. Like you said, they may know how to use their content management system, so they feel comfortable with that and they can build on those skills. But you can start your year one whenever you'd like. So if you feel like the first time you gave it a go, it didn't really happen for you, you can always start over and start with your year one schedule whenever you want. You can make a brand new year whenever you want to start it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, another question then that uh, I have heard from people, I mean, back in the day when you and I um, sort of first were aware of each other, I guess, copy blogger days, and it was very much no digital sharecropping, as in always build your own website. But then we've seen the rise of sites like Medium, where even quite famous people are writing articles or other people building uh, brands on Facebook or Instagram and, and blogging on those sites. So should we build on our own site or should we build somewhere else? And um, I guess, how do we use those different sites? Mm. It's funny. Um, at the time that you and I are recording this, Medium is having a moment because <laughs> I have a I have a membership community of people who are building online businesses, and I'm getting that question a lot in that community. Should I be posting on Medium? Should I be posting on Medium? So it seems. So let me tell you my overall approach to this. And then I'll tell you why. So my overall approach is that you should always use your website as your home base and use these other networks to amplify your reach. You can post there, but I don't, you know, you can post on Medium, for example, or you can have long posts on Instagram or you can post on Facebook. I don't think they should be your primary presence online. And the main reason is that it's not 100% in your control. And here's 
here's why I know that. <laughs> because I've been around online long enough, and I know you have too, that I see these sites kind of surge in popularity. So Medium is having a moment right now. I think last year it was kind of Instagram, and maybe before then it was Facebook. And there are these like waves of popularity where it seems like everyone is recommending that you build a presence on platform X, right? Mm. But the very fact that that the identity of platform X changes from year to year tells me that it is not in your control and you are at the whims of those um business owners, basically, who decide to do things differently because it's good for their business. And so they own the platform and they have every right to do that. So I really hesitate. I mean, I think social media and medium and platforms like that are a wonderful place to amplify your reach. They're like a bullhorn. You know, you pick up a bullhorn and it carries your message further. But the place where your message needs to live, the home base needs to be your own site because you are 100% in control of your own website. Yeah, I mean, I'm the same as you. I believe that. And I, that's how I we built our businesses, basically. And uh, that's, but it's very hard to see at the beginning of your journey. So everyone listening, take it from us. <laughs> <laughs> no, and that's the thing. I mean, this is a long game, you know, and it's not sexy to talk about it that way. It's it probably, you know, I could sell a course about how to get all these readers on Medium and I'd probably have all these people signing up for it. And for a while, what I advised would probably work. But in the long run, it's not a good approach. It's a, it's better to just put your head down and invest the time in making your own site have a presence on the web because you own it 100%. So when it starts taking off, when people start finding it, you are the person who's going to benefit from that. You're not handing over content to somebody else's platform that's going to help them build their business. Yeah, Does absolutely. that make sense? Yeah. And of course, we can give an example specifically of Facebook, where people uh, built all of those massive audiences for free and were able to talk to those audiences for free. And then they changed the rules where in order for you, your message to reach people, even in your own, on your page or within your group, you then ha had to start paying for that. So um, whereas if, for example, you build your own email list from your own website, you can talk to those people. And obviously you have to pay your email host, <laughs> but right. you've got, you have something that is, is almost future proof. Um, right. ov obviously backing things up is important. Uh, so I'm, I'm with you. We, we totally agree on that. Now, what I wanted to ask you about, because I, like, like we said, we, you and I've been doing this for a long time and keyword research is still really, really important. Um, but when I look at my business, so I, you know, I have a multi six figure income of which a huge chunk of my income is based on organic search because I have 10 years of um, content. But what is really interesting is the stats coming out around voice search. They're saying that by 2020, which is next year, 50% uh, of searches will be voice enabled. So whether that's um, on the mobile through, say, Siri or smart speakers, like Alexa. So I'm now kind of obsessed with discovering how how can we do keyword research and search engine optimization for content in a voice first environment? Yeah, I, I don't know much about that topic, to be honest. And I hope that you will write about what you're discovering. <laughs> um, I do know that when it comes to keyword research, it's it's smart to use your keyword phrase and then think about natural language variations of that phrase or even questions that people might ask about that phrase or around that phrase and incorporate those questions into the content because people have gotten smart about literally just typing their exact question into a search engine. And if you have that exact question within your content, there's a good chance that the search engine will surface it and serve it up to the person looking for it. Yeah, and um, I, that's why I think that podcasts 
are, re- are going to be a really good thing in terms of content, because obviously you and I, the way we're talking is not the way we write. So people, people use different language when they speak than when they write. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think the more we can incorporate that more natural feeling language into our online published content, the better we'll do in that environment. Yeah. And actually now it makes me think because of course I edit the transcripts to, or my assistant does now in order to make us sound more intelligent. <laughs> As in, if you, because people who read the transcripts are reading But what I'm now thinking about as I'm talking to you is, oh my goodness, but then I'm changing the words so they are not natural language. I'm changing them for people to read. Whereas will the search engines look for different natural language? There's a question. That is a really good question. And again, Joanna, when you write that piece of content, (laughs) I want to see it. (laughs) I'm definitely obsessed with this at the moment. But it's also, as you say... I know that I have my website that I can adjust. So for example, I know that snippets, uh, there are plugins for snippets that can be used for that type of thing. And I know I can go back to my cornerstone content and update those, whereas uh, I may not be able to do that on some of those other platforms. So again, the control helps you pivot for the longer term. Yes, absolutely. And that's, again, it's this idea that you're building your own asset and not somebody else's. So, and it may take longer, but you will own it 100%. And you can do things like that, like install plugins or change. You can go back to an older piece of content and update it or edit it so that it it kind of meets the best practices of what people are looking for and how they're looking right now. For example, as we're recording this, the thing that I keep hearing is video. Video, everybody's going to be consuming content on video. Well, it's fantastic to go back to some of your highest trafficked pieces of content and add a video. Just put a couple minutes of video at the top where you're welcoming people to the piece of content. Maybe you're highlighting some of the main points. And that's a wonderful way to just repurpose content that's already on your site and that you own. So try to go back and do that on an old Facebook post that you wrote a year and a half ago. You <laughs> you can't do it. <laughs> you can't do it. So, I mean, that's that's where we come back to this idea that you have an asset, you are building it, and you can benefit from it for years to come. Yeah, I, I do want to bring up there something that I've also been thinking about. So I, again, like you, I've done everything. I mean, I've done, I've had a YouTube channel for 10 years longer than I have to have had a podcast. And what's, and uh, obviously I podcast, I blog, I write books, I do all this stuff. And what I have come to the sort of realization right now is I can't do everything well. And again, with video, for example, it used to be that the quality was less important than the content. But we've seen, again, a real rise in hardcore video creation. So because of my interest in voice, I've decided to double down on voice, which is why this interview is audio only. And I'm changing my focus because I haven't seen so much engagement with video because it's not my medium. So what are your thoughts on doing everything versus focusing on, you know, what you actually enjoy? I think that last phrase that you just said is probably the most important one, what you actually enjoy, because if you leverage your own strengths and you leverage the style of content that you find feels natural to create, feels, you know, relatively easy to put together, you'll just create it more consistently and you'll probably enjoy it more. And that feeling is going to come through in your content. So let's say, and you were always great on video. Let's just go ahead and put that on the table. You're always great (laughs) on video, but let's say somebody like me who feels somewhat uncomfortable on video, but I feel very comfortable writing, writing a piece of content and adding images to it and formatting it so it's easy to read. I am in my element doing that. 
Well, I choose to create the majority of my content as written content because I want to leverage my own strengths and leverage what what just feels good to me and what feels right. And so, you know, content, if you really want it to have an impact, you are going to create it consistently for a long period of time. So it is really important to build on your own strengths. Now, that said, you, I, I do a lot of thinking with my content. So I don't know if you do this as well, but I use my content to kind of test ideas out. And if I see an idea that people seem to really respond to, if I see people sharing it on social platforms, if I get a lot of comments on it and people seem to really respond to it, then oftentimes I'll take that the concept in the piece of content, and I'll move it into a course, a paid course that I have. So I'll build on it and build it into something that I put inside of a course. Yeah, that's fantastic. And that's kind of uh, repurposing content for income, which is definitely something really good. Like like you said about the voice search, I'm going to do a course on audio and podcasting and audiobooks and voice tech um, for authors um, because I'm really interested in it. And as you said, I keep asking people and not many people know about this stuff right now, but it's coming. You know, we know it's coming. It's almost here, but um, it's not something that a lot of people are talking about. So I've seen kind of a, a gap there. So yeah, super, super interesting times. Um, but I wanted to, just before we finish, because we're almost out of time, but one of the things that um, you've done over the years, you've worked with a lot of online business owners. Um, obviously, you've started your own business. And one of the things I see with authors is, so they might be an author, so they've written a book, but that's not the same as running a business as an author. So what are your thoughts on, on some of those, um, that, that transition and, and what people need to do to move into, into running a business? Right. Well, I, um, I, I sort of took the opposite road because I ran a business and then wrote a book. So <laughs> I don't know if I'm the best person to, to help with that, but, um, to, or to speak to that journey, let's say, because I, that wasn't my journey and that's not how I did it. But, um, when it comes to building a business, the one thing that I teach and that I'm very kind of obsessed with is this idea that businesses are built in stages. And so what I find is that online we're, we're kind of, drowning in this information about how to build an online business and and courses about it and content videos podcasts all these different things and what can happen is people end up swimming around in this information for months and sometimes for years and they never actually get anything done and what I am passionate about is explaining the stages of business growth I believe there are four and helping people to understand where they are right now so that they can focus only on that stage and they can eliminate 75% of the information online because it doesn't really apply to their stage. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I mean, I I, I agree. I guess the, the thing you, you do have this free online business roadmap that I thought was was pretty cool. I wonder if you'd talk a bit about that. Yes, I do. Um, I can give you the URL where people can find it. Do you want me to give yes, you that? Yes. It's bigbrand.info forward slash roadmap. Bigbrand.info forward slash roadmap. So it's it's a very short, very compact document, but it starts out with a quiz so that people can identify what stage they're in right now. And then I have this checklist, this roadmap that's in the form of a checklist that shows people the main things they need to focus on in each stage. And the idea here is, you know, each stage has some important milestones that you really need to hit. And if you know what those are, you can ignore everything else and just focus on getting those things right before you move on to the next stage of growth. What I love about approaching things like this is that it takes away a lot of that feeling of overwhelm that people have when they're thinking about building a business. It's like we talked about earlier, people are comparing their early stage with somebody else's advanced stage 
And you don't want to do that. You really just want to focus on the stage you're in and try to get it done right so that you're building a foundation that you can build on as you move into the next stage. Yeah, that's that's great. And I do think at the end of the day, running an author business is exactly the same as any other business. You know, we have a product, we have customers, we have to look after finances, we have to do marketing, we have to pay people, get paid. You know, there are all businesses in that way have the same structure. It's just that our product is different. Books are different to, you know, widgets, <laughs> whatever. Right. Absolutely. But you're right. I think the stages are very similar and, and approaching it as stages and really just kind of focusing on what needs to happen in the stage you're in can, it can be very freeing. I mean, I have talked to people about this concept on video calls and I literally see their shoulders drop and they just kind of go like, oh, okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's a relief. It's a relief. It's like somebody has finally said, you know, you can ignore all that. That's not for you right now. It's kind of like, you know, the books on the library shelves that are, you know, two shelves above. You don't need to read those yet. Just read the books that are right in front of you right now. Yeah, actually, that's funny because it reminds me the last time I, I was speaking and someone came up to me and they're like, oh, so uh, how do I, how should I do this type of advertising and, you know, this type of blogging and podcasting and blah, and they went off and I'm like, okay, so uh, how many books do you have? And, and this guy was like, oh, I'm still writing the first draft of my book. Yes. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, okay, hold up. If you have not even finished the first draft of your book, then hold, stop everything else. Just stop. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. And that that happens so often online. And I and, you know, it's nothing against the people who it happens to. It happens to the best of us. I've seen a lot of really smart people just get stuck because they're not sure how they don't even know what first step to take because they don't know what they should be focusing on. So I this information that's in the roadmap is something that came to me a couple of years ago it was one of those like law where the heavens <laughs> kind of open and I went, oh, okay, no, there's stages and that this is what's going to help people. So I developed, it's called Plan and Grow Big and it's this approach to online business building that I think makes things so much easier. And I've really enjoyed sharing it because it just seems to have really made a difference in in people's approaches to their business. Yeah. And I love the way you think. I love your books. They are very well organized, which is so important with nonfiction. I, I, I really feel you do take people through that step by step journey. So where can people, I mean, you've given one link, but where can people find you and your books online? Well, the best place to find me is at my website, my home base website, as we've talked about on this podcast. It's bigbrandsystem.com. They can find all sorts of resources there. And then my books are at mastercontentmarketing.com and mastercontentstrategy.com. And those are both just URLs that will send people back to a page on Big Brand System. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Pamela. That was great. Thank you. It's been so fun to speak with you again. So I hope you enjoyed the interview with Pamela today and that it's given you some ideas around your own content marketing. What do you enjoy creating? What will help people to know, like and trust you over the long term? What will help bring in scalable income over time? And uh, feel free to answer those questions by tweeting me at The Creative Pen or leaving a comment on the show notes for the podcast. And yeah, that would be wonderful. So next week, I'm talking about transitioning to a full-time creative career with Blair Palmer and the challenges that you may face on the journey. So look forward to that. Happy writing, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time. <laughs>